Ja, ich habe die große Freude. Ja, I have the pleasure to greet people from the network of free school software. Schools help schools. Und das besteht aus and that consists of Jessica Wawrzyniak from Bielefeld, who is a media pedagogist, Lena Simon from Berlin, network philosophist, Jörn Seitenbusch from Minden, who is a teacher, Lennart Indlekofer, who is a sysadmin in training, and working in Baden-Württemberg in the school system. It's moderated by Claudia Fischer from Bielefeld, who is also a media pedagogist and a journalist. Thank you. I'm here for Digital Courage, and uh, Free School Software is also a project from the Digital Courage organization in Bielefeld. I would start with uh, Jessica, who started the entire thing, and um, uh, how, so how did that start? Yeah, uh, <laughs> gladly. I'll um, start in the beginning. So at Digital Courage, we have been uh, working on free software, and especially free software in schools for a long time now. And uh, when the entire pandemic thing started, uh, we thought that, hmm, OK, that's the, the time to deliver something now. And uh, we already had a series of blog posts uh, that we were working on uh, at the time. And that's uh, when we really thought, OK, we have to put some effort into that and uh, provide it now and choose the right software. And uh, because a bunch of schools were going in the wrong direction. So we took all of the information that we had and collected it together and uh, added a lot new, more new material for teachers, for politicians, for parents, and uh, packaged that into a, a, a so-called education package uh, that one can basically order with uh, brochures and books. Uh, Lena is currently showing it in the camera. And that's a big part of it. And uh, this package is, of course, also available as a PDF uh, to distribute around without all of the books but with still all of the information. And so uh, we were in that position and we, we actually distributed a lot of these packages, like around 800. And so we, we had all of this information in the world about how to do um, free education well and how free software works in the context. But it, it really lacked in terms of practical help. Uh, so, so like the, the small things that you can actually do in schools. And so we thought, um, and that's where the idea came from, to found this network for free software in schools. And uh, so within this network, uh, schools and teachers, who are the ones that actually know what works and what doesn't in schools, uh, because they are just the, the closest to, to everything and they, they know what their preferences and needs are and also what will work, what, what won't work. Also, of course, there are lots of various um, restrictions and uh, legal issues for um, things the, about what can be done and should be done in schools. And so there are lots of teachers there that are involved and then all of these schools that are already using free software, they, they can enter it, enter it into, into the system and provide help for it. They might just be um, executing some information uh, about a specific piece of software or maybe about free software in general, but of course also technical issues with installation and administration. And then there's a, a web formula that can be filled out by teachers, but also individuals um, organizations, NGOs, but uh, mostly it's intended for the teachers and because they just have the information and the background, the relevant stuff. And so they will enter what they actually use in their school. And the idea is there are schools that use free software and then there are many other schools that don't. And so, so the question is, how do you actually find these people and find this expertise that is somewhere there available in the country? So I, I read in the press sometimes here or there that there's a small school that does something and then there's another school that does something else, maybe with Moodle or Big Blue Button or Nextcloud. And so how do you actually get these people together with all of those people that actually do need all of this information and don't have any? So, yeah, people uh, post 
uh, their offers for um, help and uh, everything else into the system, uh, then it's it's moderated and we check uh, various things. Um, there sometimes uh, happen to be some proprietary solutions that hit within there and those, of course, will not go through. And then I will post all of them on a website with uh, contact information. And um, so people can just look at this page and dial the number and or write an email and actually contact the, the, the relevant people that can offer help. And this also works the other way around. So schools that actually need specific help for something can also enter that into this form and um, say, we require help with this. And then this is also collected and distributed over all the channels that we have. Uh, which is this, yeah. And then we ask that if anybody can help, uh, for example, if you can help with big blue button installations, uh, maybe specifically in uh, Hesia, then you can enter that offer for help, then please enter that, and then uh, the, the circle is essentially closed. So this is not a central number that I'm getting information from, right? So it's the schools directly talking to each other. Yes, yes, exactly. That's um, uh, what happens. The schools will talk uh, to each other individually, and um, that's um, and they they usually have a way of contacting each other via this website. And we don't have to send in between that. Uh, so we 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 couldn't even say any more than please call this number or ask this a person. They can just call each other. And uh, so that's also very um, low effort. There's not uh, a lot of administration and stuff like that in between. The disadvantage is we don't know how extensively this is used, right? Yes, yes, we don't. So there are lots of offers, uh, over 290, which is uh, a lot. Very impressive. We, we didn't expect this many. So in, in the first week when the project was started, um, all of uh, the, the, the contact information for all the entries we actually held back uh, just in case. Uh, we, we didn't want them to be um, overran with support requests. So we held them back a bit. And then a week later, we were able to post uh, 400 entries at once. And um, yeah, but we don't really know which, which schools actually require and which schools actually um, provide help. And this is something we'd want to do in the future to evaluate it a bit more. And I think we can, um, we, we actually also need to advertise this project a lot more in the places that actually need the help. The fact that so many people actually entered themselves there uh, is a good sign that many people do want to help. And um, maybe we need to make a bit more transparent that this help is, is uh, gladly given. Uh, there are people that actually really want to help. It's not like, like they're uh, shying away from wanting to help. So, yeah, somebody who actually involved themselves a lot there, uh, that's our second panelist here. Uh, they are a teacher for computer science and religion in Minden and uh, um, engaging themselves in free software a lot and um, is entered there. They are, you're giving help for Linux, uh, LibreOffice, uh, Nextcloud and uh, lots of other editing tools. There's so much you provide. So how many uh, calls did you get? Well, sadly, none so far. I haven't had a single call. What's your reasoning behind that? Well, of course, in the last few years through networking, I know several people through several people I know how schools have been equipped. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that has been put into schools and it's always an attractive solution to have a certain proprietary technology and uh, the, the, the feeling is that they want it that way and that has been the assumption at schools. Uh, that schools that have been close to desperation. Uh, we've had schools that said, we can't do a single thing, we can't even log in. And if you then put them some, give them some, some ready technology, uh, then that makes them happy. Uh, you might think I'd be disappointed, but that's not the case. 
To me, this free software thing for schools is something that shows that we are there, that we have open source as an alternative. If you ask yourself whether Microsoft and other monopoly suppliers should be used, uh, because there is no alternative, then the answer is no, because there are alternatives, and that is what this page documents in an impressive way. Yeah, and maybe we should actually mention the link to that page. It's digitalcourage.de netzwerk-freie-schulsoftware, that's network-free school software in German. Uh, you can search for the German term netzwerk uh, schul software It's all in German, says the interpreter. Now, do you in your school have no proprietary software at all anymore? Uh, is, were you able to replace everything? Uh, yes, almost. We needed a few computers for Lego Mindstorms robots because the software isn't available for Linux, the software that controls that. But we are switching now. We are going to have a new generation of IT technology and uh, we will then program in Java and uh, use a different language uh, and the computers that we've used for that can be replaced with uh, Linux. And if people say tablets into schools, they say, which company comes to mind? People aren't saying my child is, being, is receiving an, a tablet. They're always saying my child is given an iPad. Um, so that's the technology that was mentioned earlier. We as teachers were given devices for our professional needs and that were iPads with a keyboard, of course. And uh, in our schools, many iPads have been kind of fl have flooded in, we could say, which is good in one sense, because since 2017, we had been thinking that we want more mobile devices. But of course, it has to be said that the Apple company uh, regarding mobile devices and tablets has really taken over the school market, the education market completely. Google doesn't really have an alternative, at least here, and uh, um, there is no way to avoid the iPad. What's the response in your school? Do the colleagues agree and the parents when it comes to this issue, or do they demand that our kids should learn Microsoft because that's what they need in their jobs later? Well, in these kinds of debates, and they start with how much digitalization do you actually want? Um, and which means should be used? What are the side effects and risks, or should we ignore them? And can we say our children need Microsoft later? Uh, they are going to be become secretaries or something. Yes, there's a whole range of, of responses here. Just like with vaccinations, I have, the, I have the whole range from digitalization is nonsense anyway, so we don't need any devices, up to we need to have the most recent stuff. We have to see that we have the technology that, uh, the, the leading technology, uh, you could say, and that would be iPads. You have to be honest there. And uh, another solution with other devices, tablets, is hard to administrate. And uh, people wouldn't probably, with the kind of inertia and yearn yeah, for comfort, um, but, but the range is enormous. For four years now, since we've been working on this concept, we are in a continuous discourse, and there are so many opinions in that. And uh, can you still administrate? Uh, or actually, are you in those debates all the time? Well, thankfully, I have to say, there was this kind of sea change in 2017. And uh, I was able to win colleagues over to doing the administration work. And we kind of divided it into pieces. And every piece in our concept was given a head uh, of some responsible person. We had presentation in the rooms, which is an issue, administration of the devices. Um, uh, then I have the networking and Nextcloud department, and that's the way we divided it up. Otherwise, I wouldn't have done it, uh, not with the uh, 
the amount of hours that I would be given to assign for that task would be that would be too little. And we can see that it's not a one day thing. It's not, it's a process that takes months uh, or even years to uh, make that change. Media concept work is a process always. Many people have said in the pandemic, oh yeah, digitalization, now just make up your concept and then order the stuff and, and you're set. That is a very strange idea about media concepts work. We've been working on this for years and we never finish. When we finished one version, then the next two pages, uh, the last two pages already include an outlook f into f towards the next few years and what we have to uh, develop in, in that time. And it's never really going to be finished. But that's how it is. That's how IT works. It's never really finished. Imagine how it was 10 years ago. The way you work then is, is completely different to today. Leonard, you had this wide grin when we talked about the concepts. You are a, a, a student in a, a, a vocational school in the state of Baden-Württemberg in the Southwest, and you are a member of the network against Microsoft 365. You were very active against uh, Microsoft, and you are the person most affected uh, because you will have to work with. Do you think that people are listening to you? Yeah, as uh, people do listen, but um, the the response to what we're saying is is very slow. So there were uh, a couple of things that um, were added to the. So there there is now a ministry that has to ask us about a few things, and we were invited uh, to a few things, which was a, a very voluntary thing, but um, it did develop into because we, we weren't really um, okay with the current plan of involving Microsoft tools for everything. And uh, so that, that we were uh, not really listened on that. Uh, so people didn't really listen to us a lot about that, uh, even though the uh, data protection officer did agree with us. And um, then after a, a, a few discussions, we were actually invited directly again. And uh, we, we hope that people will listen to us directly and not will be like, oh, actually, well, there, there were, were, were a few uh, things said against this. But uh, so, yeah, we hope that they're listening more now. So. Free, what what value does free software have for you as a student? So for me, it is mostly that um, I can easily understand. Well, okay. So if Microsoft will have all of our student data, I know that I, as a student, am in school, and Microsoft has to get my data because I have to be in school. So why? Do they? But I don't understand why my school needs to pass those on, right? So the school has my data. Why do they need to pass it on to somewhere else? We are in, in a country that should be able to produce this kind of infrastructure. Oh, and now my camera apparently turned off. Well, um, I'll ask anyway because we can still hear you. So the data that is potentially uh, ending up in the Microsoft Cloud. That's one thing, but the, the use of free software and the possibilities um, of using that program in the future. So in the, the place where you are learning, can you actually use your knowledge about free software? Well, yeah, in the company I work at, um, because I'm currently uh, doing an apprenticeship, um, yeah, very much so. We all know that 90% uh, of the servers out there are using Linux servers most likely, and uh, operating on mostly free software anyway. So basically all of the servers I'm looking at at, uh, at, at work, a lot of them have free software on them, and uh, yeah, most of them have uh, Linux on them. So that will also bring us now into for, onto a look to the future. In, during the preparation talk, I was asking you how long you are still doing this. So I, I know you are currently doing an apprenticeship, but it's probably going to end at some point. And uh, so the uh, council that um, so supports these efforts is going to be elected again soon and uh, of course there's a lot of um, joining and leaving there so how do you ensure that the students in uh, Baden-Württemberg uh, will actually follow the, the, the political line that you're um, establishing here so yeah of course 
in theory, can we direct nicht regulieren. Yeah, so in theory, we can't really prevent uh, this and, and say uh, our followers have to do the exactly same thing as we do. But um, the, the nice thing is that uh, we are actually uh, required to um, supply counsel to the, the government uh, ministries that actually decide things there. And um, we will, of course, um, pass on all of the, the stuff that we have been working on and we offer them to, to keep going. Of course, we will try to encourage them to do that. But uh, the last couple of years, the um, Landesschülerbeirat has always been a fairly neutral entity in the school politics and um, didn't really have a political agenda and really just recommended what made the most sense. And that is essentially what we did as well. We um, have uh, 60 members, and um, of course, that's not just uh, me, myself, uh, who decided that we want to follow this, uh, but uh, we, we had an election about this and discussed a lot uh, about whether this is the right thing to do. And we had, well, around 60, not everyone is always there, but like 40 or 50 uh, votes that uh, were for this and decided that we want to uh, pursue this this effort. And uh, I'm fairly certain that uh, the ne during the next election cycle, the next um, student, student government ministry will um, also follow this. So yeah, there's the chance that uh, this might be a uh, long, more long form development. So Lena is a network politics um, activist. And so from the individual view, we want now want to change to a more uh, more outside uh, view onto this thing. Translator's note, we are not getting audio from Lena. And just a slight correction, Lena is a net philosopher. But the audio is still missing. Well, next to the young people, uh, we are telling people to turn certain knobs and tell people to operate devices, but we're not telling them how to unscrew or open the device and see what's going on behind the scenes. So the young people are taught to become completely immature. We are not teaching them to question what is going on or find out what they might like and what they might dislike, dislike, because there is just the option of either clicking or not clicking in it somewhere and not really look under the hood any further and see what is going on. And that is not possible. So with proprietary software, that is what's happening. Free software, of course, makes other things possible. Yes, with free software, we could do so much more. We could actually look at the stuff stuff that we use that we use and see what is going on in the source code here that is fairly complicated but you could gain certain ideas and maybe change a detail and uh, see what happens and that is what makes computer inter computers interesting and uh, keeps people engaged and what gives people the option uh, of learning about IT security for example and understand what they have to do in order to not be completely unprotected as they surf the net. And uh, that, of course, also opens the option of uh, students uh, perhaps maintaining their student PC themselves, maybe as some kind of a working group, which is not possible if they are given the Microsoft license, which has to be transferred to all computers, a kind of work that is not very rewarding at all. It's so boring, in fact, that uh, no one, no student uh, really will uh, voluntarily want to do this and maintain this. But uh, as soon as it comes to deciding what software is good and what should be used and which software is free and uh, they don't have to acquire a license for that, that gives you so many more options and that's what makes things so much more interesting. Now the money issue of course is one that uh, the argument the, that students can then do things independently at home, independent of their parents' social status, very important social effects. Yes, that is a very important point. That's equal opportunities. Uh, we give everyone the same base of information, which software can be used, 
and they can then download that at home or use it if because it's free and schools are not bound to expensive licenses that they have to keep paying for and finding a budget for and because they use open formats maybe uh, you can use free software at home to actually join in with some work from home or the school could change to another software it's much more free than what you have with free proprietary software and their own their proprietary formats and um, We've already heard that, uh, of course, people have to go to school, children have to be sent to school. And uh, if I then tell these people who are compelled to go to school that they also have to have a Google account and have to open a Microsoft account to access the school cloud or something, uh, this is not something we can do without uh, an account at a US company. Uh, you can't actually... Uh, kind of fulfill your obligations, that is not something that is, is allowed really. And, and data protection issues, of course, have come into that as well and, and, and uh, caused trouble because from the data protection point of view, this was not acceptable. And there were other reasons why free software, especially in schools, is important uh, because schools have the uh, special situation that advertising isn't uh, that much tolerated there. If you go to a drinks uh, vending machine, uh, it was not possible to, to have a drinks vending machine in schools because that was advertising. But if you say there's only one network that you can use, if you uh, want Office software, you have to use Microsoft. It's nothing but advertising, in fact, advertising for these products. But if you say, hey, we will learn about free software, uh, we have a transfer uh, and Microsoft could be used uh, because the formats maybe are interchangeable, uh, it's possible. So this kind of transfer is possible and uh, you have a certain base from which you can manage to kind of move on to Microsoft if you want. And that gives you equal opportunity. And then you have the issue that most of the free software projects can be used in a decentralized way. And that in terms of IT security is important too and protects you from monopolies because schools are going to use different solutions with their autonomy and uh, the uh, sovereignty over that software is then with the schools and not with some computer in a cloud farm or somewhere, server farm, whatever. Okay, yeah, we could continue to go on for another half hour if I ask you, how do we get there? And you, you as a net philosopher, as someone who doesn't just want to explain society, but also try to change it. Could you perhaps briefly summarize, how can we get people convinced them to go along this route? Uh, teachers, the uh, supervising authorities, the federal state governments, how can we actually get some movement into this? The first issue is that we have a free democratic education concept and ideal that we all subscribe to, and that can, contains the very same values that free software has too. So the, why this hasn't been brought together much earlier is really beyond me, and we should link up to that and say that contains everything you need. Just take a closer look because that is the way forward. That's how we can reach this, this concept of, of free democratic education that gets, gives people the chance to become mature, autonomous citizens. And that is a very important point. And the second, well, kind of simile that I would like, that I like to use is a system in which I cannot understand the rules, in my eyes, is a totalitarian system. So if you want to change the criminal code, for example, and backdate that change so that the deeds I have already done are under a new penalty suddenly, then I no longer am, am in a democracy and I'm not under the rule of law anymore. I have to be able to know the laws that affect my actions and understand them, even if I cannot understand them myself. But I can get advice. I can ask a lawyer and ask them to defend me in court and interpret the law to me. And that's the way it works with free software too. At the time, I, I use it and inspect it, and that is the code. Again, that in this, this instance, it's the programming language. If I cannot look into that code, I am in a totalitarian system again with proprietary software, and I am just simply exposed to that 
that to whatever is put in front of me and I cannot check it. And that applies to both the people that can read the code and those that cannot, but even those that but, but those that cannot read the code cannot ask a lawyer, no, sorry, a, a computer scientist, and ask them, tell me, is it okay? Uh, I often am asked in the kind of uh, counseling that I give, is Apple good? Is it safe? And I can only say, that is their business secret. I can either trust them or not, but I cannot verify. But with free software, I can verify this or have it verified, and that is such an important difference that uh, there shouldn't be any more arguing necessary. It should really be our aspiration to not be in a totalitarian system. Yes, thank you, Lena. Thank you to everyone else. Uh, of course, there will be questions now, right? Ah, I guess he doesn't have any yet. There, there he is. All right, I will pass on to you and your questions. All right, so a big, a big chunk of the questions is about all of this uh, problematic with ISERF. Uh, the problematic issues. So uh, various issues like what happens if a school has to change, uh, a kid has to change schools, what will happen to the data if it changes schools, is it even possible to get all of this data, um, stuff like um, how, how is this uh, controllable or uncontrollable. So the iSurf installations are usually um, uh, on on a Linux server, which is uh, one of the nicer things, uh, which is uh, actually on premises at the school and uh, provided by the city. This is a Linux server. Um, back in the day, that uh, was mostly uh, pedagogical uh, solutions from um, Baden-Württemberg or something like that. Um, some uh, basically just one Linux box that basically has all the services that can run on there, including a file server and messengers and whatever. And uh, of course, also device management. But uh, of course, all of this data is coming from the school management software. And I don't really see an issue uh, of interfacing with external uh, positions there and entities uh, that might be exported from the school management software and then read into as a CSV file to create the, this account. So this is not something that um, isn't, isn't prepared before. And if a school has to be changed, of course, this data has to be uh, switched over, migrated onto the new school as well. And if the new school does have an ISERF, then that account, those accounts will be created and or imported. And I don't really see an issue about um, the the data um, ownership there. And so if yeah, if, if, if I had to transfer that into something else with like Microsoft Azure, that might be more, for the, uh, more, more difficult. So I think actually ISAF is a, a fairly reasonable solution here. And I've also recently read that well, this this um, ISAF company from, from Brunswick, they have th their own scripts in PHP and Perl and stuff. And uh, all of those are actually visible. You can actually look at the code, which is also uh, some a pretty good move, I think. So it appears, so my, my kids are actually uh, not, not in school anymore and didn't have a lot to do with that. But if, if when I imagine this, so they go into the mindset of imagining uh, 20, 25 years back and thinking that my kids would have to actually think about uh, this this kind of stuff, I I I, I get the shivers basically uh, as as a father, and so 
potentially. Was there a chance that to 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 make it in such a way that there's a, a, a public school server and school cloud with open source applications and stuff? So yeah, that does exist. And that's the, the, the structural problem here. So school and the educational sector is a, a system with many individual actors and the the actors within one school um, that is a, a very small system the the kids and the teachers and then of course there's the bigger system of the the school carrier essentially that that um, main organizes the schools and then there's the the state government that um, uh, has to organize some things. And actually, they also have uh, some sort of software called Lugineo now, which um, is used in the management and is actually in large parts open source, or at least doesn't stem from uh, a, a big monopolist uh, software distributor. So the 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 state governments are actually providing this but there's of course some friction there between all of the different entities and so no but the the the, the state governments can't and won't force any of the individual schools to use this or that and uh, there are various software solutions like Lugineo this Lugineo that now and that the schools can test those and if they don't like that then they can use the ISA from the local uh, city government or something and if that's still not great and a lot of parents say they want something else then they can still decide that they want to go with Microsoft or whatever so this is um, currently a, a very many layered system uh, like, like like a very big cake and uh, wherever I look in, into this uh, entire stack of things I see very different interests and whatever is actually decided in, in one specific school depends on a lot of various people and uh, councils. This is, of course, kind of interesting, but it also results in a very non-uniform uh, result. And there was recently a, a networking meeting um, from our local uh, city circle, and we talked a lot about uh, how how much is Logineo used in the in the state here. Uh, do you think that this has any future? Should we use that? Which communes do I serve? Which do Logineo? And what should we use? It, it's all very much in 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 flux, so to say. Leonard also wanted to say something to this. I actually can't even remember what, what I uh, what I signed up for. Um, so I can mostly just agree to what was just said, especially uh, in in my local government of Baden-Württemberg. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. If, as long as I'm heard anywhere, that's fine. So here in Baden-Württemberg, we had the exact same topic. There was a platform supposed to be created by the state government and uh, that was um, started various times and uh, failed all of the times. And there's a third of schools that use Microsoft, a third that use the state government solution and another third that use something else that we don't even know about. And yeah, that's it's the same situation. The state government can provide things, but uh, the, the individual school organization uh, structures um, are deciding this. And if they say they want this, then they, they do. And uh, then there's another thing, and there's uh, different schools, for example, the, like the one where I am at, and they say that they, they, they use the state solution and also something uh, made by themselves, which can result in something like every teacher at the school suddenly using a different system, and uh, sometimes classes being totally um, overwhelmed. I remember, for example, there was one uh, teacher that used Microsoft Teams, and where I was able to say I didn't uh, agree to this, and... Um, I, I can't participate and then I had to leave the class and couldn't participate. Then there was another teacher that uh, sent data using email but uh, and at least it was on a school email server but uh, then sometimes there was also like private emails were in use and stuff which is also not great so yeah as the students back then we said we we need one unified state solution and we actually had something in Baden-Württemberg that worked fairly well but then we also needed like some other software components and those barely exist uh, I, I won't get more into that because <laughs> that will take too much time but yeah but it would be great if every state government could just produce a, a reasonable solution. 
because yeah, we don't just have the, the digitalization problem and of course also the pressure of the pandemic making everything more urgent and um, that makes it even harder to bring all of these opinions together. Jessica. So another thing that makes this uh, more difficult is that the, the organism school essentially will um, use uh, various things and then um, uh, this information is provided to various ministries and then the ministries are looking at various solutions and, and everybody says that they recommended things here or um, prohibited things there. And so the, the, it, the, there is the expectation that the politics are going to do anything and the, the new German government is, does make some promises that are fairly, um, that can make one a bit hopeful. And so if, if one of these solutions might be created at some point, which we can only wait for, there um, is, is just the, the waiting for people to push the responsibilities around. and. Um, Hope that something is created. Do we have some more questions? We still have five minutes. And yeah, there are some more questions about ISERF, like, for example, how secure is it? I don't think we can really uh, speak to that right now. Um, and yeah, so much more topics. No, not, not any more questions. Oh, yeah, that. Jan and then Lena. Jan. Yeah, I wanted to say one more thing. Um, we need to, like on, on all of the layers, we need to work on this. It, it doesn't really make sense to only work on the school level or only on the, the city level or only on the state level. Because on all of these, in all of these places, there's only a limited bandwidth of digital um, mind space and people uh, being involved in this and also being interested in this. So this is something that we really need to work on in all of the layers, all of the entities, uh, with students, with teachers, uh, with people in the city governments and with people in the local uh, ruling entities. And um, as is so often in these uh, unsure situations, of course, it's also very much dependent on a lot of individual people. And yeah, that's also a thing in that I wanted to say again, there uh, are, uh, there's lots of money for various things and then people say, oh, the schools aren't even using the, the funds that are available. And then they uh, say like, okay, we have to write uh, such complicated uh, application contracts and stuff. And of course it makes sense to not just throw money at a problem and uh, not have any concept, but it uh, also is, is something that is very difficult to put all of the um, effort and all of the things that have to do on the schools. And that is also something that we wanted to do, do with this education package that we talked about earlier, to, to uh, provide a concept that uh, a, a school can use to uh, write a concept to e more easily get the money from these um, funds. So, and yeah, we're asking why, why do, does there need to be a, a, an organization like us uh, that has, uh, pr is providing the schools with this, like can't this be done on the state level? And so the schools say, okay, we want to do a, a unified solution for everyone and then they're running in the different, in, a, in the wrong direction and uh, then everybody else uh, is, is disappointed again. So. This is, of course, really, really hard, and uh, I can totally understand if individual people are totally overwhelmed, and it is very much important that uh, we are working on all of these layers. And uh, there especially, is, is uh, that's where free software is the key, the, the key technology, the, the thing where we can all agree, if, if, if we can all agree to, to, that we do want to work on free software, and then we get together and work on um, uh, finding solutions and uh, with with this common base that would uh, probably help a lot with uh, the, the schools getting together and it would be great if all of these experiences that would create be created there and would not just be distributed by uh, digital courage but also at the various um, uh, governments that are responsible for the schools so, if anybody is watching who uh, is working at uh, a state government in the education sector, 
Um, then even there, the, uh, there's, the address is digitalcourage.de slash free network school software, freies Netzwerk school software, to actually contact all of these individual schools. And um, you, you can use that. Uh, it's also to be used by, by parents. The idea is that we do want to make this project more public, and that's also why we're doing this talk here right now. And that's why I want to pass on to Jessica for a few last couple of words. What do you think are the next steps for us? So the next step for us is uh, very much the, what you just said, to build out this network and uh, use all of this material and all of this knowledge and bring it to the places that actually need them. That's where we need to go. We all like know a lot. We are all within the bubble. We like to go to the RC3 and we really like data protection, but not everybody is uh, tuned that way. And uh, that's the kind of people we need to reach, that we are talking about all of these topics, that we bring attention to them, and that we really like work on all of these um, tuning streets that we have available and uh, yeah this entire thing can only work if we um, really work on all of the all of the places individually so yeah all creatures please share share this thing share this message and this website and everybody can help with this yeah thank you very much to all of you applause to all of you uh, we will imagine the